We've seen how polar coordinates and cylindrical coordinates are designed to describe regions that look like they live in a disk or are related to a cylinder. There's another type of alternative coordinate system that we can use in R3, and that is spherical coordinates, which is great when you want to describe regions that look like they belong to a sphere. We're describing points in R3, so we need three coordinates. The first one is called rho, and this is the distance from a point to the origin. So if my point is this point here in the first octant, rho is the length of the line segment from the origin to that point. In polar coordinates, the radius can be positive or negative. In spherical coordinates, rho is strictly a distance. So this is greater than or equal to zero. Then we have an angle called theta, which is the angle a point makes with the positive x-axis in the xy plane. So it's actually the exact same notion of theta with cylindrical coordinates. If I take this point and drop it down to the xy plane, theta is this angle here. Then the most exotic coordinate when we switch into spherical coordinates is an angle called phi. And this is the angle our point makes with a positive z-axis. So if you imagine describing points on the globe, if we set the north pole to be a phi angle of zero, and then we travel down from the north pole, the angle that we would rotate through to get to our point is the angle phi. The north pole is zero. The equator, or the xy plane, is pi over two. Then all the way down at the south pole is phi equals pi. Now you could keep rotating around, but you're gonna end up duplicating descriptions that you could arrive at with different choices of theta. So we take phi to be between zero and pi. That way we're just measuring where a point sits between one journey from the North Pole to the South Pole. We're not gonna wrap around. Then let's see what X, Y, and Z need to be in spherical coordinates. Take this point right here, drop it down to the X, Y plane. We form a right triangle whose right angle is here. This point has coordinates little r cosine theta, little r sine theta with a z coordinate of zero. But little r doesn't come into spherical coordinates, so I need to take this notion of little r and change it into spherical description. So I need to figure out how to describe this radius here using spherical coordinates. To do that, let's create a pair of right triangles. So now this right triangle is similar to the one we started with. This side here is the radius we're looking for in the xy plane. By Sokotoa, notably sine of phi is r over rho, we see that r is rho sine phi. So that's how we would describe the xy coordinates in the plane. We lift them straight back up to where we started and it's the same pair of xy values. So x would be rho sine phi cosine theta, or typically we order that rho cosine theta sine phi. Y is rho sine theta sine phi. And then if you look at this right triangle up here, this height is the z coordinate. Cosine of phi is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's z over rho. Therefore, z is rho cosine phi. So these are the spherical coordinates. It's a radius out from the origin and two angles. Compared to how we navigate on the Earth, if we think of being on the surface of the Earth as always having the same rho, then changing theta would take us along the latitude. That would be like moving around one latitude if we alter theta. Whereas changing phi is like moving up and down a longitude. So different theta values are like different points on a latitude. Different phi values are like different points on a longitude. Okay, let's do some algebra with spherical coordinates. We know that when we're doing integration problems in multivariable calculus, we expect to see quantities like x squared plus y squared, or the square root of x squared plus y squared, or x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So let's familiarize ourselves with the conversions that we would see with these expressions into spherical coordinates. Okay, so what is x squared plus y squared? That's gonna be rho squared cosine squared theta sine squared phi. 
and then y squared similarly will be rho squared sine squared theta sine squared phi. Okay, I'm going to factor out the rho squared on the left and the sine squared phi on the right so that I can write this as rho squared cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta and then sine squared phi. Then cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is one. So this simplifies to rho squared sine squared phi. So then if I were to take the square root of x squared plus y squared, that would be the square root of rho squared sine squared phi. Normally the square root of a quantity squared returns you the absolute value of the quantity. But in this case, the absolute values are unnecessary because rho is non-negative and phi is between zero and pi, so sine of phi is always non-negative too. Okay, let's take x squared plus y squared and add z squared to it. From the above, that's going to be rho squared sine squared phi plus z squared is rho squared cosine squared phi. So overall, that's just rho squared. In spherical coordinates, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals rho squared, and that's exactly the equation of a sphere of radius rho. With that in mind, let's do some sketches. In spherical coordinates, let's sketch the equation rho equals five. Implicitly, this means theta goes from zero to two pi and phi goes from zero to pi. So what is rho equals five? Well, that means x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 25. So the graph of this equation is the graph of a sphere of radius five. It's not a solid sphere. So if this were a beach ball, it's just the plastic part. It's not the air on the inside. If we wanted the solid sphere, we would be looking at rho less than or equal to five. Okay, what about theta equals pi over three? This one is a little bit strange. Let's say this angle in the xy plane is pi over three. Together with the assumptions that rho is greater than or equal to zero and zero is less than or equal to phi is less than or equal to pi is actually a half plane. So we don't go backwards in this direction. In polar coordinates, you could go back there with a negative r value, but we don't have a negative r value here. Rho is greater than or equal to zero. And the angle back there is not pi over three if theta is between zero and two pi. So if we insist that theta is pi over three, and then rho is greater than or equal to zero, we're only going to get this part of the plane. The last example is really neat. So what does it look like if phi equals pi over four? So that means that I go to the North Pole and I measure down pi over four in any direction. I could measure down towards North America, towards Europe, towards Asia, in every direction, I go down by pi over four. So that's like this. And the angles that we would be opening up would all be pi over four. If you piece this together, it's an upper cone. Okay, so I hope this demonstration helps you understand the types of shapes that you can describe with spherical coordinates. The first and third are most important. So when we're looking at a domain of integration, there might be a spherical part or a cone part and we can begin to translate those domains into descriptions with spherical coordinates. Before, when we looked at integrating with polar coordinates, we talked about how we pick up a factor of r when we switch from rectangular coordinates to polar or cylindrical coordinates. So there's gonna be a similar statement here for spherical coordinates. What we would have written as dx, dy, dz isn't just gonna be d rho, d phi, d theta. There's gonna be a scaling term. So let's take a look at the derivation. So imagine that we have some solid sphere and we wanna partition it into little pieces in order to set up what would ultimately be a triple Riemann sum. We're not gonna do that part. How would we slice it? 
Well, for one thing, we would slice it radially outwards from the origin, like slicing it into concentric spheres. Those would be slices with respect to rho. So you can see we would slice this way, and we would slice here. That would be slicing along two different values of rho. We would also chop it up with respect to theta. So that would be like the pi slices that we formed when we switched into polar integration. We're going to have the same type of wedges for theta. And then we would also slice with respect to phi. So we would slice up our spherical object into little pieces that looked kind of like cubes, but the sides are curvy, as you can see here. So this blue face I've highlighted on the bottom, that's sitting flat against the smaller sphere of radius rho 1. And then this face out here, just so you can see the, what the picture is showing, that's sitting flat against the sphere of radius r2. So those are sort of parallel with respect to the radial chopping. This shape is approximately a cube. So to compute its volume, what we're going to do is treat it like a cube. So to that effect, we'll compute the area of this blue base and multiply that by what looks like the height of the cube, which will be this edge here. The height right here is the easiest piece to identify, I think. So what is that height? It's actually just delta rho. So you could follow it up to the top here, or you could map it down to the xy plane, so that you see that height there, that gap, is just delta rho. What I'm calling rho 1 and rho 2 in this picture probably should be rho i minus 1 and rho i, but that's OK. We'll just leave it. Now for the area of the blue base, let me label the sides L and W for length and width. The segment I'm calling the length is part of one large circle, like a longitude circle, on the sphere of radius rho 1. So here's the circle in question. I'm going to exaggerate the size of L. So L is a little circular arc on the circle of radius rho 1 sitting opposite the angle, which is actually delta phi. So using the arc length formula for a circular arc, L is equal to the radius times the angle. Similarly, W is also a circular arc, which we can project down to the xy plane as being this little piece right here. In our circular arc formula, the angle opposite that would be delta theta, but we need to figure out this radius. You can see it's not rho 1, which is this middle one, or rho 2, which is the outer one. It's a smaller radius. To figure that out, let me add in a line segment that's going to create a pair of similar triangles. OK, so in particular, I have a right angle here and a right angle there. So you can see that this triangle is the same as this triangle. So the radius we seek is the length of the line segment I just drew. Now if this is phi k, this would be phi k plus 1. Let me just call it phi 2. The hypotenuse of this right triangle is rho 1. So we have an angle, we have the hypotenuse, we seek the side opposite the angle, so we can use sine here to say that sine of phi 2 is some radius divided by rho 1. So we can say that the radius of the circle in the xy plane that's tracing out w, or for which w is an arc, that circle has radius rho 1 sine phi 2. So using the same formula as above, but with that radius and an angle of delta theta, we can say that w is rho 1 sine phi 2 delta theta. OK, so now we're ready to go. We have our height, that was delta rho. We have our length, L, that's rho 1 delta phi. And our width, W, which we just found to be rho 1 sine phi 2 times delta theta. Now this piece of a spherical region that we've chopped out in this picture is not very small, and it's not really a cube. 
But if you imagine chopping it finer and finer, so if we treat that object like a rectangular cube, its volume is now approximately row one delta phi, row one sine phi two delta theta, delta rho. Okay, this was not a proof and we're certainly not gonna do the full Riemann sum here, but I just wanted to illustrate how you can get at the differential form that we need when we switch into spherical coordinates. And to make that switch, we're gonna replace what we would think of as dv with rho squared, so you see I have two rho ones there, rho squared sine phi d rho d theta d phi, where of course those latter three terms are ordered to match the bounds of integration. I'm going to stop our discussion of spherical coordinates there. In the next video, I'll do some examples of integrating with spherical coordinates. So we have that to look forward to. See you then.